Hello and welcome to today's podcast, episode 72 of the Sean McGuinness podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, you will see I'm in a different part of the office today. Myself and the team, aka just me, had to relocate in this part of the, part of the, um, the office. Because I normally record this in the evening and obviously in the morning the sun's coming up from the east which then shines right into the camera lens and I can't see a thing so if you're watching this on YouTube there's some nice plants behind me that Louise tried to decorate in here and if you're anything like me you actually like watching podcasts on the video form it's definitely something humanistic about that watching someone's mouth move and listening and taking it in a bit better that's actually how I spend most of my time most of our TV usage is just spent watching stuff on YouTube and obviously I have some other good content that puts a bit more context into what I'm saying rather than Instagram which is 60 seconds so go check it out it's Sean McGuinness I'm pretty sure so type that in you'll find all that there just finished my training session this morning and I was just kind of thinking when I see more people that are beginners getting into the gym I always I actually think it's brilliant and I feel happy in a funny way than when I see people who are trying to obviously regain the fitness you can kind of usually tell that, that that you're new and for me for myself I find that way more inspiring or way more motivating um, than seeing more fitness people who are already in shape training. That's obviously brilliant as well, but I um, yeah, I really feel it's great. And when I'm looking at them, I'm kind of thinking these thoughts, but then I have to catch myself and go, okay, stop looking at them too much in case they think like, oh, this fucking gym fella's over here looking at what I'm doing. And then they get paranoid and and feel a bit more self-conscious but it makes me think of the clients that I've trained face to face and their journey to where they are now some of them that you may look at them now and think they're the more fitnessy person but when they started their complete beginner completely out of shape um, actually have one of my clients out on my clients out there at the moment Aoife shout out to Aoife I think she's down about 20 kilos we started during lockdown and now she's at the stage i think we're about a year in where she started to join the gym and i've just kind of brought her through this journey now she's in the gym i'm always kind of thinking two steps ahead and i'm like okay i know machine work are going to be a bit easier to do you're going to be a bit self less self-conscious doing the machines because they require a little bit less te technique, one plane of motion. So I plan that with that in mind <laughs> rather than what's most optimal in terms of fat loss and muscle gain. That's usually most optimal because it means she's gonna feel less self-conscious, it means she's gonna feel more competent. And then in one of the theories of motivation, I think it is the self-determination theory. Correct me if I'm wrong. They look at different ways that increase motivation or maybe increase the kind of likelihood that someone's going to carry out a behavior and one of them is competence so the more competent you are doing something the more likely you're going to do it which makes sense we can all attest to that if something's a bit hard and you're not very confident in the gym that's good it's going to be another kind of excuse that will may prevent you or make it harder to carry out the habit and um, the other ones are autonomy again kind of related to competence in a way and what is the other one oh my days it's too early um but yeah competence is the main one i want to talk about that 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 was the main one winning that but that was just a tangent that was just something that's on my mind and i see it the same way when I go for a run across the road, there's a nice hill there that a lot of people jog up and when I see people who may be getting back into the fitness or beginners or even beginners or people regain their fitness with their kids, with their family, I think that's absolutely brilliant and inspiring And because I know how hard it is to, to exercise like that 
and obviously it's sometimes it's 10 100 times harder when you're out of shape carrying a bit of excess body weight so i'm like damn respect but again i catch myself i'm like sean stop fucking looking at them you might come across a bit creepy or judgmental or whatever but that's my thoughts if i ever if you ever catch me looking in the gym um it is for the right reasons i'm not not the other way now you know my thoughts relating back to one of my clients who just mentioned Aoife today's podcast we're going to talk about the five main habits that will help you maintain your weight loss forever generally people are very good at losing weight they are pretty terrible at keeping that weight off and there's some physiological reasons that we'll talk about but a large proponent is going to be habitual obviously anyone can jump on a mat a stupid diet and do some crazy exercise and you're going to lose some weight short term 100 percent but to carry out that long term and to really ingrain those habits so they eventually become unconscious that is the challenge and that is what a good coach does they they start with the end in mind and they look okay what kind of habits do we need long term to be able to maintain this fat loss forever perfect how can we start to ingrain them from the start so we're getting a nice little combination of obviously getting results getting that short-term motivation but we know on the other side that person's going to be set up for success versus oh mrs jones you should come in here and do this 12 week body transformation where we're going to give you 1200 calories and we're going to run you into the ground with hit training and we're going to give you a meal plan and we're going to tell you exactly what to eat and you're not allowed to drink any alcohol and you're not allowed to eat any carbohydrates you're not allowed to drink any eat any sugar or drink sugar if that's your thing and on the end of it yes you're going to lose 10 kilos but guess what in the 12 weeks after what we're not going to tell you in terms of conditions is you're probably going to regain that weight and more and then guess what you've just wasted all that money from the 12 weeks you've wasted all the time and effort of the 12 weeks and let's be honest you've done 12 weeks no alcohol no carbs no sugar for nothing that's a bit of a waste in my opinion at least <laughs> you've just yeah like when you think about it, it doesn't really make sense does it so to prevent you from going through that pain which unfortunately a lot of people who come to me may have to experience in some form or fashion but take my word for it if you've done it before or if you haven't it's a clean slate listen to the stuff we're going to talk about today because it will stand you in good stead and prevent you from from this because ironically not to have too much about that but I always say I hate to see people getting ripped off and waste money. And if you can imagine all the like stupid fitness challenges or f- diets that people would do, say over a 10, 15 year period, and you calculate all that time, all that effort and all that money, you could have just invested into a good coach from the start and that would save you all the heartache. So we're going to explain why <laughs> and these things are not just i'm not just throwing them out there they are um scientifically backed in the studies that they've done on people that have kept i think more than 10 20 percent of the weight off over a three or five year period i'll have to double check that again these are the things that are common between all those people that are successful and I can definitely back them up over eight, nine, ten years of working with people, the ones, the clients I've seen that I can call to this day that have still maintained that weight loss. They definitely practice these out. And ironically, when I look at it, these habits actually carry over to many other aspects of your life, not just fat loss, but any other behavior change things. So the first one is what's called cognitive restraint and what that means is basically after you reach a goal you still need some kind of rules surrounding what you eat and maybe surrounding how you exercise so 
obviously restraint referring to some kind of restriction so it's some kind of conscious restriction without too much but just in a good way that are going to enable you to maintain um, what you're eating now obviously when someone has reached the goal we've talked about this in previous episodes what you may do is then you may bring your calories up to maintenance calories and just try to maintain where you're at so generally if you're in a deficit maybe add 500 calories onto that deficit kind of monitor your body weight to see where you're at and when it stabilizes whether it's up or down from that 500 calories that's around where your maintenance calories are okay but as we know we know how easy it is to blow our calories so even though we're eating a little bit more than our deficit we're eating our maintenance calories we still don't want to fall into the trap of of doing well to reach a goal but you completely forget all the rules that got you there. It's kind of like for those uh, into MMA, if you look at Conor McGregor, obviously done brilliant to get where he what to get to the point where he is today. But let's think about his last few fights. If you don't watch MMA, you'll you'll get the point I'm trying to get across. At the start, he carried out all these habits. He trained hard. He basically devoted his whole life to to MMA. Those habits enabled him to get to a certain place. But if we look at his last few fights, he's doing some other stuff that he wasn't doing at the start. So he's going away from the habits that got him to the place where he's at. It's kind of like fat loss. People get cocky, then they go away from the habits that got them there and suddenly they're back at square one. Conor McGregor, I'm going to assume from looking at him and kind of reading up on everything what's going on, he's gone away from that devotion to his craft that got him there. So if you're going to maintain at the top and now you're cocky and yes, you have an ego, but you're not doing the work you're not carrying out those same fundamental foundational habits that got you to place where you are what's going to happen when you go away from them you're not going to be able to you're going to lose some you're going to lose your fights because the people that are actually beating you are carrying out those fundamental habits better more consistently and this is the same with fat loss so cognitive strength basically means being mindful and having a level of control around what you're eating even after you reach your goal and this can be different for everyone this could be some way that allows you to eat around your maintenance calories for some people that may be tracking the calories for some people they may know especially say less during during the week they may know or may have calculated once they've got to the goal what an estimate of what their maintenance calories is in the form of three meals per day so they don't necessarily have to track the calories but they know once they stick to this certain structure around eating per day they may have two or three options for breakfast two or three options for lunch two or three options for dinner they know they can go away from calorie tracking because they know those meals are calorie tracked this may mean for other people that don't have the time to do all that they may just get the meals ordered as i said before it may mean that you set yourself certain goals that like you prepare your meals during the week or it may mean and this is going to relate to the second point it may mean that you have an idea of what you're eating but maybe you'll weigh yourself daily and you'll find maybe when the weight starts to creep up a little bit that's when you go back and start to to really track your calories again see where you're at make sure there's no stuff creeping in or creeping out it's kind of same with your bank account i'm going to relay a lot of this to spend it because it's it's where my um conscious thoughts have gone especially in the past year when we look at a pandemic and stuff it's actually been a good period for me to be able to look at that and and although i have good fitness habits i don't maybe have the best spending habits but that's okay a lot of this applies to each other so it's kind of like you're monitoring your budget or you're monitoring your bank account you're like well this is getting a bit low i thought i was spending a certain way and then you start to go through your statements and you go well this fucking netflix is here stan apple subscriptions have i got to cancel you sign up for seven days you think you're gonna 
cancel after the set before the seventh day and guess what they charge you the annual fee and the blah 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 so it's, it's stuff that creep in and this is so easy to happen in today's world especially with regards to eating that again you may have a certain way that you you stick to food wise but then if you kind of compare it to the times you're successful well suddenly mrs jones in the office is giving you a little bit of almond croissant every morning suddenly you're going in and you're just picking unconsciously some chocolate bars in the afternoon so it's just little calories that are sneaking in and in combination with some kind of self-monitoring that just enables us to go okay let's come back to our basics why is this happening why is that creeping up track my calories for a week or two become conscious of where those extra calories are coming from and then um, that's how I got back to where we were within this cognitive restraint we know an easy way to basically keep our hunger and appetite in check and allow us to regulate those hunger signals good so we can maintain around where we're at and we'll stop prevent us basically from overeating we know the cognitive strain in that is going to stick to a high protein diet that that in itself is going to be a rule that we stick to food wise a high veggie intake and potentially fruit and good carbohydrate intake that in itself is some kind of a cognitive restraint some for some people it may just be sticking to like 90 percent 80 90 percent whole foods that in itself because you have to remember when people are going to talk about intu intuitive eating absolutely bullshit if you if we look at intuitive eating intuitively your brain wants the highest calorie foods to, for survival it's never going to pick some broccoli or cabbage or lettuce over peanut butter over an alma croissant so these these mechanisms you cannot override if you have two things in front of you or if you're surrounded by these foods you're gonna eat them, so we have to be, so so people that intuitively eat and maintain, I'm gonna say intuitively in, in quotation marks, they're not intuitively eating. If I've worked a long day in the gym, I've done a lot of face-to-face, -face, I'll walk home, walk to home Surrey Hills, there's some absolutely amazing food places. My intuition wants to go in and absolutely destroy that pizza place absolutely clean out the kebab place but i'm habitual and um, let's say habitual my habits but i habitually stick to a certain way of eating where i don't necessarily eat out of those places i stick to most of the stuff that are going to be home cooked whole foods and that in a way is a cognitive restraint we will use this cognitive strength in combination with that kind of flexible dieting mindset that we have created in the past so we know if on the occasion that i do go eat and go in and go do you know what i'm sick of it i need that smash this pizza that's okay because if i need to i can come back to some of the tools strategies that i've developed coming to the stage where I know how to adjust my calories down for the next few days if I go over a lot or I know how to save my calories for that pizza if I really want it where I might just skip breakfast or skip a meal and save my calories for that I know how to adjust my plan versus someone with like really high cognitive restraint but say they go in and have that pizza on the other occasion they may succumb to the thoughts where like you know what fuck it I've actually just wrecked my plan I haven't stuck to cooking i haven't stuck to the rules that i set and i'm gonna just blow the wheels off and start again next week that is too rigid so we're trying to get cognitive restraint with a nice little mix of what we said before autonomy which is having the, the flexibility and freedom to be able to choose your own outcome in a sense and um rigidness too much flexibility is bad because it gives you too much choice you get the decision fatigue too rigid is bad because you start to develop kind of all or nothing mentality which is um which is bad so that is that the second main habit that we need as as mentioned is some kind of self-monitoring and that could be weighing yourself daily there's a lot of research weighing yourself daily the people that maintain the weight loss and do this habit i know 
I'm tr- I'm thinking of the people that have like lost 20, 30, 40 kilos and have maintained that weight loss and they will use self-monitoring a lot. Obviously anything um too much of a good thing is a bad thing sometimes. So some people can get too fixated on self-monitoring in a sense. Sometimes at the expense of actually looking at their their more ha- their habits. If that is you you may go away from daily weighing, but you may use a different variable to, to, to manage or to measure. Whether that is, I have people picking like a jeans so a jeans or a pair of shorts that fits them nicely, and they may use as that as the variable to like try on every week or two weeks or month, and that keeps them in check. When those, when those buttons are not fitting as much, perfect, it's time to go back to step one some kind of self uh, some kind of um, conscious awareness of where we're at then some kind of regulation within that and adjustments so it's again it's the same case especially in my early 20s when i used to go in sydney and alcohol is not cheap in sydney especially when you're like me <laughs> this relates to the spending habits when um i'm not frugal at all if I'm out, I'm buying everyone drinks, um, whether they ask or not, and obviously that's not always a good thing because you can rinse your bank account pretty easy. So the next time, I'll, next day I'll wake up, I go, oh no, not only do you have a drink hangover, but you have a like, spending hangover, you're like, oh, I don't even want to check my bank account. I don't need that negativity in my life. Get to Wednesday, your card gets declined, and then what kind of you haven't done yourself any harm so you're only kind of delaying the inevitable or you're actually making that worse in, by denying that same thing goes for self-monitoring people go well i don't need that neg- negativity but would you rather just that little short-term kind of negative thought that is that is actually a positive because it's going to bring it's going to rain and um, bring the rains in or would you rather you step on the scales 12 weeks later and then realize you've gained 10 kilos because trust me, that happens. That happens, happens, happens. We know how easy it is to gain body fat in today's world. I see this a lot, especially my online clients. Say if I haven't seen, I want them, ideally people are trained to weigh in three times a week. If they can do it every day, the better. In the most cases, again, provided they don't have too much of like a, um, a mental, association in a negative way with it in that case we may use something else as i said but i've seen people not weigh in for a few weeks and i'm like oh no i know this is going to be bad even though i'm messaging them they might be still be tracking their calories in a sense because it may not be 100 percent. or as we know it's we're kind of looking at calories in calories out so although their food may have been good their activity may unconsciously drop and then that's going to sway that occasion towards more fat gain as well so my advice definitely weigh in three times a week daily weighing at some point in time is very good because it gets you to see the fluctuations and you may combine that with periods of doing daily monitoring with um, measurements and then vary between the two if if you really have a bad time with that but uh, as I said, I think people get used to it. They they have to, well, not they have to, but um, people don't do well on the scale because they always step on it on a Friday and then it's down because they've just like, generally people are better, quotation marks, during the week, so they may be burning more calories, taking a bit less in, so the muscles are gonna be a little bit less filled with it glycogen which is which is carbohydrates and water that w- that's going to weigh us so if you kill us less the weekends generally going to be more processed food processed carbohydrates a bit less activity which means we're storing more carbs which is broken down into glycogen and that's broke and um, that's stored with water so for every gram of carbohydrates stored about three grams of water so you have a big carbohydrate weekend even if it's in your calories suddenly then they get on the scales on Monday and it's up for a few kilos and you think you've gained weight but you haven't you've just gained so you think you've gained fat you haven't you've just gained water weight so so don't think within that 
Number three is regular exercise. It may sound very simple and you're like, oh, of course you need exercise. But again, people go away from the habits that got them to the place. That in, and when we're looking at exercise, we may get someone to, this is where step goals are very good, I think, because it, it just gives them that conscious measurement. And again, the more self-monitoring, the better. The more cognitive restraint, the better. Because if you look at steps, our body is made to usually, sorry, our body is made to conserve energy. It's why you feel lazy to not train because it, it's the first point in ever in evolution when we're having too much food and we have to voluntarily exercise. It's never happened. What not what's happened in the hundreds of thousands and millions of years of evolution is we have evolved in a scarce food environment. So without much food, so we've had to conserve energy. So these mechanisms are in our brain. So having some kind of step goal can kind of make us conscious of that and and push past those those mechanisms that are inbuilt because if we intuitively move we're going to not move at all that's what happens so step counts are good and again if we look at some kind of resistance training weight training ideally two three times a week is good to maintain those results we've got to that point to maintain that to maintain that muscle to maintain that muscle is going to enable us to keep our metabolism high and burn more calories that's going to obviously tie into keeping our metabolism strong and the more we move the more we exercise we're going to get lots of endorphins or what they've discovered now like we touched on last week um, especially with cardiovascular training more that endocannabinoid part of the brain which is going to make us feel good the more natural ways we can make us feel good in today's world are not only going to reduce stress but going to reduce the kind of um emotional eating that a lot of people succumb to because it's so easy so when we give a brain good chemicals it's not going to use more unnatural ways of looking for that point in addition lots of movement lots of exercise regulates our hunger well so you'll find the days we don't move around a lot you probably crave more food could be a combination from a psychological point of view of boredom and like we touched on those brain chemicals but from a physical point of view they've seen people who i think eight thousand steps is the minimum their hunger and appetite regulation is much better and the more you move guess what the more the less time you're thinking about food which is good so then we can move for purpose and eat for fuel versus that we're not doing much we're bored we're sitting around we're like you know what i'm gonna get some food to cheer me up here that's more hedonic eating and that's dangerous because that's how we gain body fat easy because we end up doing it with delicious high calorie high palatable food number four um there's a few in here i'm gonna say from looking at more general pop people social events managing social events 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 and that will tie back into the kind of flexible dieting strategies mindset whatever you want to call it being able to adjust your calories down being able to foresee what's going to happen to plan your meals ahead of time okay i know i have a big event on saturday i'm going to really meal prep all my meals during the week or or plan them out or structure them whatever way i'm going to stick to that on Saturday, on my skip a meal, that's going to leave me with an overall um, deficit of a thousand calories that I can use for my event. So you've, you again, you're looking at averages of a course of the week in regards to calories. You're being able to manage them. You're going to be able to think ahead of time, and you have all these tools within your toolbox to allow you to um, go through today's kind of awkward world as well. Like losing fat without social events is very easy, but um, it's it's gonna happen this is a part of life and it's a good we need it to be part of life because of social creatures so we need to develop those coaching strategies which is why we have to go through the process of learning about these things as we go developing these tools developing these strategies and on this point i have written down an asterisk asterisk Aoife, i've touched on again within the times that she's lost weight especially 
Emma, go back to the podcast where Emma, where we talk about this a lot. This has been the game change of her, especially, especially if you're in Ireland or England, where drinking is a big part of the culture. You don't necessarily want to um, isolate yourself, <laughs> but you want to find ways of being able to do, to to live your life with these strategies. So it's why when people go, Sean, just give me a meal plan. I stick to it. It's going to be pointless in the long run. It's pointless to stick to stupid diets when you don't learn about amounts. Imagine you're just you're gonna you're gonna buy something big on the weekend, and your budget is I don't know five hundred dollars, five hundred euro, and you're gonna buy something for five hundred euro. Well, it makes sense to go. Well, do you know what? I'm not not gonna fucking spend that much during the week. I'm gonna use that budget to spend on what the big thing is. Versus you spend your normal budget and you buy the big thing. Well, now you're just you're in a net loss of five hundred dollars, and if you keep doing that you're going to be at a loss, you're going to be at a loss, um, and it's the same your fat loss. We need to develop these strategies, which is why it's a long-term process, which is why oh, I'm just going to do the keto diet. Pointless. You're going to lose a bit, you're going to put it back on because you haven't developed these things. Psychology is all about if someone suffers with, say, let's say anxiety, obviously many different reasons why this happens, but what, what a psychologist is trying to prime them to do is give them the tools to be able to, okay, when you start to get that tightness of chest, I'm going to start to diaphragmatic breathe. I'm going to, to come back to certain kind of thoughts. They may use different therapies, which are going to arm you with different strategies, CBT, um, blah, blah, blah. And that is what they're trying to do, give you different coping strategies. Number four for me. That was number three. I can't remember if I called number four. I'm just picking them in order. I have them in order here, but I'm actually just on the spot picking off what I changed my mind on. So number four, it's actually kind of, this is more of a quote unquote mindset thing. I hate that word, but it's the only way to describe this. And that is thinking of yourself in 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 a new identity. So. Ideally, we get someone to the other side of, of the point where they've lost weight and they're maintaining and have these good habits, they change their life, and they actually think of themselves as a new identity in a, in a good way. So instead of the person to start being, I'm, I'm an overweight person and I'm on a diet, now they're suddenly a fit person. That's the way, that's their mindset is they are the person that exercises the suddenly at the start they were the person that's trying to exercise that hate hates exercise now they're the person that loves to exercise that's a part of their identity so yes we're trying to get that person from being the l-shaped person on a diet to being the lean and fit person that's their identity so suddenly when they're out or suddenly when they're having little mental battles with themselves oh maybe at the start i was like oh i need to go training but I'm not really good at it or I don't enjoy training. Well, suddenly now the talks they're having with themselves or with other people is no, I train every day. It's a part of who I am. It makes me feel good. Or if it's a case that I know we looked at like flexible dieting that you can fit certain foods in, but you obviously you don't want it all the time. When someone offers you something in office and you, you don't want it at the start, it's like, oh, my trainer told me I shouldn't really have that. Suddenly, now you've got to the point where you're like, no, I don't eat those foods. In obviously a non-massively restrictive way. But I don't eat those foods. Or I don't eat those foods without tracking them. Whatever it is. So your your tone within yourself is more, is more definite. And you are the lean person. It's why when I briefly touched on um, spending habits. Something I've got into a lot lately. And funny enough, <clears throat> even going back to the first point I put in my notes here, where we talked about cognitive restraint, you need to carry out the same habits. And <laughs> something I fell victim to before is when I would start to earn a lot of money, my spending would go up. I can't remember, there's a name for it, you're probably showing on your screen now telling me. 
but basically this woman actually found her on YouTube she's brilliant and um, I think it's called the break and one of the rules she says is obviously she someone else said it but she's just relaying the message is when you're rich act like you're poor or like when you're poor you you when you don't have that much money you budget a certain way you make a last but the hard bit is then when you start to earn more but you you still need to earn more money but then carry out the habits as if you were still not earning a lot and that's the challenge obviously that's why people you could be earning all the money in the world and still go broke and there's countless stories of that obviously mike tyson lost 500 million um countless anecdotes of mil of people winning a lot of willing ridiculous amount of money but because they didn't have that base of spending habits they went broke and it's the same way like you could be training the house down it's kind of like thing where you can't really out train a bad diet in a sense but but it still stands true so what was i even saying there <laughs> so when it comes to sorry when it comes to the identity i'm trying to form you're trying to go no i don't buy all my meals out or you you're you're trying to become that person that you're trying to become the mindset of the rich person in relation to those habits so your tone might be obviously i constantly reevaluate my budget i don't waste or i don't spend over amount on when i'm out or um whatever it is obviously you can insert whatever thing is there but in combination to the habits you're trying to ingrain you're trying to ingrain that identity of that person and that is the powerful one and lastly one of the main things we can do is a constant reevaluation of our goals so within fat loss i touched on emma who um, has been brilliant and it's one of the reasons emma and sharon these two girls are trained more face-to-face face-to-face clients they have been able to go through two lockdowns and actually get better results than ever before because the two three four years previous has been about laying the foundations of all these things that actually when we got into lockdown was way easier because they didn't have to navigate through all the stuff that's hard as social events eating out that was so easy for them so not only have they maintained those weight that weight loss but they've lost and Emma has now maintained to the second lockdown completely to the other side. And when I talk about constant reevaluation of my goals, she's kind of looked at where she's at in regards to training and said, you know what, for the past three or four years, I've been in a fat loss stage. Now it's time for me to maybe build my physique a little bit, start to build some muscle. So you're constantly reevaluating where you're at. When it comes to fat loss, when it comes to getting to your maintenance calories, this is like, from an approach point of view as well as a habitual point of view for long term um, to keep you in the game because obviously when you're losing weight you're getting that little hit of dopamine motivation and that's going to keep you going but the hard bit is like what do you do when you've reached a goal without that like reinforcement well suddenly you may need to change your goal suddenly you may it may need to be a little muscle building goal where you go into a little bit of a slight surplus over your calories and focus on maybe 10 to 12 weeks of of trying to build some muscle and then you may go 12 weeks or whatever it is of maybe some fat loss and then some maintenance so you're cycling around different performance goals that will keep you training that will keep you focused with your food it could be a case that you get to your maintenance calories where your goal is and you're like okay in combination with all the stuff we talked about cognitive restraint um, con- continuous self monitoring you may now set yourself a performance goal I'm going to increase my squat or deadlift or bench or obviously it doesn't have to be those traditional lifts it could be anything I'm going to focus on my gym performance now that I'm giving myself more calories I'm in a maintenance calories so my energy is going to be better I'm going to focus on increasing my strength in the gym more now I'm going to ink I'm going to focus on my weak body parts my shoulder has been unstable i'm going to really get that 
and focus on all the stretching I need to do and all the mobility and all the um, stabilizing muscles, those smaller muscle exercises to get me to the point where I can do those bigger lifts. So I may get to the point where I've lost a lot of weight. I, I touched on last week's episode. I'm gonna go into maintenance calories and now I'm gonna focus on maybe trying to run or increase my aerobic fitness. You need stuff, and this again <laughs> relates back to the girl where I was listening on spending, where she said, look, you can't, you can't just go in your goal without giving any positive reinforcement. Your, your brain, po- dopamine release is a survival mechanism. So if you can feed it a little bit positive reinforcement, it's going to say, oh yes, the habits we're doing are, are beneficial. Um, so in spending terms, it may like when you hit your uh, savings goal, you may, I don't know, buy yourself something nice, would obviously account for. The same goes for um, training, nutrition, etc., etc. And that's why, like we've talked about before, within performance or even when you start off, the more variables you can give yourself in regards to measurement, when you see those metrics improve, it gives you that positive reinforcement. So the worst thing people do is, okay, the, obviously their goal is weight loss, maybe at the start, but don't just use that on its own. Use it with pictures, use it with measurements, because you know the weight's gonna fluctuate a little bit. Use it, write down your weights that you lift in the gym. Log maybe your blood pressure when you start. Log your resting heart rate when you start. Maybe get your blood test done at the start. All these metrics, the more metrics you can have, the more positive reinforcement you're gonna get when those things improve. Because again, even that when your weight may fluctuate a little bit over the course of the month, we know as you get fitter, your resting heart rate's gonna come down, your blood pressure's gonna come down, your, your, your weight training's gonna go up as you get stronger, more consistent. Use all these variables. So in a long-winded way, when you get to your goal, you might use performance goals, you might use constant, continuous re-evaluation of your goals. As we said, if you're constantly self-monitoring and you start to creep up a little bit, okay, you come back, you do a review. This is why it's handy to have a coach. Even after you've you've lost that weight, I've trained people for, oh, I think my longest client, seven years. <clears throat> Since I started, I think a year after I started, and she still she followed me everywhere. And it's for this reason, like she knows she's actually good at getting to where she is, but she struggles to maintain that bit, and that's why I come in. I can constantly reevaluate where she at. She just has to put the metrics up, and it makes it easier for her. So have that within your plan. Some other notables that I have down here is support network. Um, obviously, that will tie into creating and keeping a good environment in your house in regards to your partner they can make life easy they can make carrying out the habits you're trying to carry out as easy as possible instead of putting constant roadblocks in your way that also applies to your friends in regards okay they know you're trying to stick to your goal or stick to your maintenance calories and not offer you fucking drinks when you go out they know within that and obviously yeah you're just trying to make those habits as easy as possible to carry out and the less favorite ones harder to carry out and if you can have people around you to understand and will help you along the way that is even better and the last one no we'll leave it at that leave it at that and this is actually just a snippet of the new ebook that i have written and that's going to be out in January and this it's about I think it's about 20,000 words but do you know what I've actually looked at all the nutrition stuff out there and it's great for those already in the field and it uses lots of big words and mechanisms but for people that just want to know the basics of what to do in this moment there's nothing out there for you so Mr. Sean I know it might say a big S here for my Sean my first name but you can also say Superman. I've come to the rescue. I've I've written this, and that is no doubt going to encompass everything we've talked about into the most bite-sized, easy, digestible things that you can do to apply to your fat loss today. And we're going to touch on how to maintain those habits and everything else for life. So, yes, that's a snipper. That's a little teaser for that. But there you go. Hope you enjoyed that episode. 
always start with the end in mind ideally you could get some advice or guidance at the start to be able to put these things in place to along the way so with those habits in mind you are constantly getting to the point where those things are unconscious so you've gotten to where you want to go and you carry out those habits unconsciously that doesn't mean there is no conscious thought or evaluation as said there is that's what people need and we need to do and there is no finish line remember that but it is a beautiful process one that is going to leave you in a healthier happier more confident state and it is worth every penny and ironically when you get to the stage where training is a part of your lifestyle you become more susceptible i don't think is the right word i can't think of it at the top of my head to those like endocannabinoids and, and endorphins and you actually get more feel good release or maybe receptor uptake and so you feel even better and that positive reinforces everything so people get to the end stage and can't imagine not having training in their life at all there you go signing out if you liked and enjoyed the episode please share it to the many people i know you know that need to hear this episode save them the heartache of having to go through that process without understanding these mechanisms that will help you live the life after you've got to that point please like and review on itunes spotify or whatever the other platforms that are these days there are plenty and again if you want to watch on youtube go on to sean mcginnis on my youtube that is all going to be getting some guests on next week i'm going to be traveling in january so for people over that side of the world i'm going to be getting them on some face-to-face podcast which is exciting and there you go hope you all have a great day and i will see you on the next episode